Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this staff town hall. I'm Jessica Alexander, president of staff assembly. Before we get started, we have a special guest who would like to say a few words. I'm happy to introduce Chancellor Block. Thank you, Jessica, and good morning, everyone, or good, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, want to thank you for being here. So I appreciate all the staff and faculty who are tuning in today. And of course, I want to thank the staff assembly for, for hosting the meeting today. This is really important, and we appreciate you, you doing this. So, you know, when the, fan, when the pandemic first hit, you know, our focus was really immediate, you know, the needs of the community as we switched to virtual work and virtual instruction. And I think, you know, that was hard for everyone. And uh, my deep appreciation for really a successful transition at an extraordinarily difficult time. You know, as the pandemic has lingered, we've realized we now need to, a longer term response. And that was the logic of why the task force that's going to talk to you today was really established and, and designed. And I want to thank, obviously, the, the, the co-chairs of it, Professor Morans and, and Vice Chancellor Beck, for their leadership, but for everybody in the 11 working groups that are working on every aspect of having a successful recovery from COVID-19. And that, in, that, that includes both short-term goals, obviously, to keep, our, keep everyone safe and as productive as possible, but also long-term goals, because we recognize there's gonna be lasting impact uh, of, of, the, uh, of the pandemic, and it's probably gonna change the way we do work and the way we study in the future in, in significant ways. So there's both short-term and long-term goals, and all this really being applied with an equity lens. You know, the one thing that has become so clear in this pandemic is it doesn't affect uh, people equally. And we can see just from what's going on in even our own community in Los Angeles, how disparate the impact is of, of the pandemic. And that's something we have to be mindful to, and we have to rededicate ourselves after the pandemic to help remedy some of the reasons that these uh, inequities have developed. So there's, there's a lot here, deeply appreciative of what the task force is doing. But I have to mention one other topic, which is not part of the pandemic, but is uh, on everyone's mind, and that's the upcoming election. And uh, obviously, I want to encourage everyone to vote. That's how we get all of our views known is by, by voting. And you can vote. There are vote centers at Ackerman Union, Bradley International Hall, and the Hammer. And there's also a, a ballot drop box on the median at Westwood Plaza and Strathmore Place. And that's where uh, Carol and I voted. And uh, just have to be a little careful of the traffic, but it's, uh, it's very convenient. So we recognize this is a stressful moment, obviously, with heated politics uh, during a stressful year. And we're not going to probably know election results right away, as in many elections, it takes some time to, uh, to determine uh, the outcome. During this time, I know it is going to be challenging for everyone. And we've been sending information on resources and spaces to our community to, to come together. And we'll continue doing so. We'll, we will certainly be in contact with you. I think the most important thing is to support one another. Uh, as you know, this is extraordinarily challenging, given this at the intersection of a, a contested election at the same time there is a pandemic. So I hope all of you stay well, stay safe, and uh, I'm really hoping we all see one another in, in person soon. So thanks again. And now I'll turn this over to Jessica so she can continue the town hall. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Chancellor Block, for your support of UCLA staff. Staff Assembly is a volunteer organization that is for staff by staff. And our 17 member executive board works hard to facilitate programs and events to continue to build staff community and bring resources and information to staff virtually, such as this town hall. I'm joining you all from the Luskin Conference Center, along with Administrative Vice Chancellor Michael Beck, co-chair of the Response and Recovery Task Force. We are, we are adhering to COVID safety precautions, wearing face coverings when around others, and otherwise physically distancing at six feet apart. We are also joined virtually by Michael Morans, co-chair of the Task Force and past chair of the Academic Senate, Dr. Peter Katona, clinical professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine and adjunct professor of public health at the Fielding School of Public Health, and Luby Levin, associate vice chancellor of UCLA Campus Human Resources and staff assembly executive sponsor. We have put together a brief presentation based on the questions that were submitted by staff during registration for this event, and we'll also save time for a Q&A session afterward with our panelists. You can also submit questions during this town hall. Please use the Q&A function rather than the chat. 
We will try to answer as many questions as time allows, but you can also visit our staff assembly website at a later date for an FAQ doc along with a recording of today's town hall. With that, I would like to turn it over to Michael Morans to begin with an introduction to the work being done by the task force. Thank you, Jessica. And as the chancellor said, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the staff assembly for helping us put this together. Um, it was uh, their initiative in a lot of ways, and um, we really appreciate uh, their efforts in this. Uh, if we could start the, uh, the slides. Next slide. So as as the chan whoop you went a little fast um, as the as the chancellor said um, you know one of the things that we've become aware of I mean everybody is aware of is that this is not a simple short term emergency but that it's uh, a challenge that we need to think about in terms of a longer period of time and so whereas the first task force that was set up in the summer the future planning task force was trying to handle the immediate impact and emergency of the COVID-19 crisis. The new task force is, is really trying to think both in terms of how we can get through this year in a sustainable way and also look forward um, to what changes may be necessary as um, we confront the impact of COVID-19 over time. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is a simple uh, model of the uh, task force membership itself. What we've tried to do here is to bring together um, people from different uh, aspects of the campus and from different uh, uh, positions on the campus, faculty, staff, administrators, North and South Campus, uh, in order to provide some sort of overview for how we might think about and suggest to uh, senior campus leadership, how they might think about and approach the short and longer term challenges of COVID. Uh, next slide. Uh, as Chancellor Block mentioned, we have 11 working groups, each of which have been hard at work um, for about a month and a half now. These groups, as with the task force itself, include staff, faculty, students, and administrators, and uh, they are all being run in a, in a very democratic and open way. Next slide. So the task force itself is um, being, has been charged with doing a couple of different things uh, to monitor and, and handle and mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 on the campus itself. Um, we're working and we're, we welcome suggestions on this. Um, to develop recommendations that will enable members of the university community to continue to teach, learn, discover, and work in a sustainable manner, that is to say a humanly sustainable manner, um, and also not only to address this year's problems, but to begin to think about the eventual return to campus um, when we hopefully will get a better grip on the pandemic and to think a bit more long-term about what uh, UCLA might look like in its practices um, after the COVID crisis passes. Next slide. Um, one thing that I think is important to recognize uh, is that our flexibility is determined by a combination of state and county public health guidance and regulations. As you all may know, the state has recently um, instituted a multi-tier system in which they basically place counties in a different tier based on their um, status in terms of controlling the pandemic or at least um, managing it. We are presently in the purple tier one. Uh, this means that the state has prohibited lectures and, um, in, and re ordered us to reduce a lot of activity, the county has gone even farther. It's our hope that we may be able to move to tier two um, in the winter, but that depends largely on whether LA County itself is granted by the state um, uh, the, uh, the ability to move to tier two. That's not something that we have any control over. And on that note, I'm gonna turn things over to Michael Beck. 
Great. Thank, thank you, Michael. And I want to thank the, also thank the staff assembly and also thank Jessica because she's actually participating in uh, on the task force and some of the working groups. And I appreciate everybody's involvement in that. It, it really is a, a community effort uh, to help the campus get through the, the, this pandemic and help us continue to thrive uh, to ensure that we can continue to be the number one public university in the country. As, my, as Michael indicated, there is set, it's a waterfall of, of uh, regulations associated starting with the state, uh, moves down to the county, and, uh, and then ultimately the camp, campus then creates its own uh, policies and procedures. And the county at the, at the current time is ba basically uh, limiting the access uh, to the campus. It's prohibiting all uh, instruction on campus except for uh, very limited uh, areas where uh, criteria that's able to have classes on campus. And uh, the work on campus is limited to, to essential, wor uh, essential work that, that uh, needs to occur that, uh, to continue to operate the campus. So as we go through, as we go through this, just as a reminder, we're, we're going to go through the slides fairly quickly as we will also post these slides uh, as part of the, the uh, recap of this meeting at this town hall. And so if I go too fast, that's okay because you'll be able to get the data uh, follow up a little later. We want to make sure we have enough time for all the all the questions. And as a reminder, there are no uh, events or other gatherings that are permitted on cam campus. And as if anybody has been near campus, uh, right, sees all of the signage that says that the campus is currently closed to uh, the general public. So with all of the protocols and procedures that, that the university has developed in support of the requirements coming from the county and from the state, uh, we put together a number of uh, protocols that all of them are available at BSO, uh, the Bruin Safe Online uh, webpage. Uh, two, of the more crit two of the documents that summarize sort of what we refer affectionately to returning to onsite work and returning uh, uh, back to school, those documents you'll see also have uh, similar tiering. Uh, we refer to them as stages and they refer, uh, uh, correspond to the limitations associated with what is being handed down by the state and uh, by the county. Some of the other uh, protocols that might be of interest, I'm not going to go over all of them, but the symptom mon monitoring protocol and requirements are there. And then also the protocols for testing both uh, symptomatic individuals as well as the asymptomatic testing. And we did, we have been testing uh, individuals on, on campus for since uh, before school returned. And this week, we actually started the uh, comprehensive asymptomatic testing program. Basically, we are that anybody, uh, student, faculty, or staff member uh, that is on working on campus, living on campus, or learning on campus is uh, subject to uh, mandatory testing. And there's different uh, frequencies for that, depending on what cohort you currently reside in. This does exclude the uh, UCLA Health, uh, primarily because in the clinical operations, uh, they're wearing uh, significant PPE and other limitations and it uh, deemed that it's not necessary to, uh, to test individuals within the health system directly. Athletics has a more robust uh, testing program where they're testing athletes every day consistent with the Pac-12 uh, testing protocols that they've put together. Uh, starting in mid-November, we're excited that UCLA will be part of the California COVID Notify. This is a, a contact tracing app. It's a partnership between Apple and Google, uh, which was uh, piloted by UC San Diego and UC San Francisco. And UCLA will be part of that program in mid-November. It's a voluntary program, which is, allows people to register uh, for the app. And then if, in fact, you uh, ended up coming in close contact with somebody who ends up testing positive in the future, the app will notify you that yeah, of that situation and encourages you to contact your 
if you're a faculty or staff member, your primary care physician or student to contact ASH. We're constantly being bombarded by information and it's hard to know where the factual information can be found. And so we put some of the references here. I've referred already to the Bruin Safe Online website, which has uh, much of the technical information for the university. Strategic Communications has put together a resource website of additional information. Uh, there's a link there also to UCLA Health, which has additional information. We've also put together a uh, set of resources and tools that have uh, for staff and faculty that are working or teaching uh, particularly remotely and uh, try to find some additional information for them. Uh, certainly the Bruin posts and uh, forums that we've uh, had and continue to have are a way to get information. And then of course, LA County, the State, Depart uh, uh, State Department of Public Health, as well as the CDC have uh, very robust uh, websites on COVID, and I encourage you to, to reference those if you're looking for factual information. Just quick summary for UCLA. Uh, we've had to date since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, 214 students who have tested positive, 108 uh, faculty and staff who have tested positive, and unfortunately we've had one uh, staff, staff fatality. Uh, the chart on the bottom shows you the 14-day rolling average, uh, positivity average. And so you can see uh, both the state and the county uh, having higher percentages than where UCLA is, but you can see that as testing has increased on the campus, the positivity rate has gone down, uh, which you would expect as we've uh, tested more individuals. Uh, and we are uh, finding individuals uh, through the asymptomatic a testing program that uh, were not did not have symptoms but did test positive so it's become a really wonderful intervention it's very easy to do i actually participated in the covid testing on monday of this week uh, it's very smooth uh, happens very quickly it's self-administered uh, mid-nasal swab it's uh, uh, painless and it's uh, quite fast they've got it well organized so i encourage folks to participate in that uh, many of the things that we've talked about and you've read and we've continued to reiterate, there's a number of things that you can do to continue to be safer through the pandemic. Uh, this is consistent whether you're on campus or whether you're at home or in your community. And it's uh, the, the many things that you've consistently heard, which is to wear face covering, coverings, uh, maintain a safe distance, and uh, wash your hands uh, thoroughly multiple times a day with soap and water. Uh, we strongly recommend uh, flu shots if you're, if you're on campus or even if you're not going to be on campus. Uh, one of the challenges we'll face within the flu season is uh, having hospitals that could become overwhelmed with flu patients and uh, will then be, find it difficult to be able to cope with both uh, COVID patients and with flu patients. And for many of the symptoms are very similar. So you could, could end up with the flu and end up being uh, put in, placed into isolation uh, as if you were, uh, had, had COVID. So those are things that we would strongly uh, recommend everybody to do and ultimately avoid large gatherings uh, uh, anywhere. And then uh, one of the questions that continues to come up, which is when is UCLA going to reopen to a larger uh, component than exists today. And that's really dependent on uh, maintaining the lower case rates in LA County and within the UCLA community. It's uh, ensuring that there's high, high compliance with the campus community on our, all of the mitigation measures and uh, making sure that the available testing capacity uh, continues. We're very excited about the fact that we've uh, been able to get uh, uh, high throughput uh, testing capabilities that are available now. And there's also a lab that's being set up on campus that'll be able to uh, support not just the campus needs, but uh, the needs of the community and other higher education institutions uh, because of the, techno the advanced technology that's been, in de that's been developed. And ultimately, uh, before we're able to come back and uh, return to life 
the way that it was before the pandemic started, it's really going to require the availability of a vaccine and significant uh, deployment of that, meaning which uh, the vast majority of the individuals in the population have been, vac have been vaccinated and then uh, returning. But even when that happens, it's likely that, that uh, the way in which we work and the way in which we learn will change uh, permanently in some fashion. So I think you'll see a lot more telecommuting uh, even post COVID. And with that, I, it's my pleasure to uh, turn it over to Dr. Katona. He's gonna give you uh, really some wonderful uh, statistics and data about the science as well as uh, the patterns associated with uh, COVID-19. So Dr. Katona, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm going to talk about the current public health aspects of, of COVID-19. Now, COVID-19 is novel in many ways. It's brand new, it's global, it's highly contagious, and can be quite deadly. And it's actually three diseases in one. It's an infectious disease, it's an autoimmune disease, and it's also a cardiovascular disease. So it's actually three diseases in one, and it has consequences after the fact. We have these, quote, long haulers, or people who have a mind fog, people who are feverish, who, who have have weakness. We have these people that kind of linger on. We have this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And we have this surge in healthcare needs, which is becoming more and more problematic now, particularly in the Midwest. So look at some of the trends. And it looks like there's been about 40 plus million people infected globally with more than a million deaths. And you can see the outbreak seems to be going in an upward direction. We're not talking about humps here but globally it seems to be going in one direction. If you look at it in the United States, we're kind of seeing three humps, but the humps are not isolated. They don't go back down to zero. It kind of came up, went down a little bit, went up again, came down, and now it looks like we're headed in the wrong direction again. And also usually pandemics become socioeconomic equalizers. This has been touched on already before, but it looks like Blacks and Latinos seem to have a much, much higher incidence of cases than whites do. And this is very unusual because usually pandemics of this nature are equalizers of all socioeconomic strata. So this is very unusual. Moving down to California, we're actually looking at one hump which peaked and seems to be going down, but maybe there's a hump now that's starting to, starting to occur just now recently. LA County is very similar. It seems to be one hump going down and then maybe starting to climb up again now. And if you look at cumulative cases, we're at about a 300,000 mark. Remember, we're in a, a county of 10 million people. This is a significant portion of the population that's already been infected. Deaths, if you look at it globally, seems to be somewhat leveling off, although in many jurisdictions, death seems to be, seem to be going up. But they do seem to be doing better in LA County, possibly because of good resources, a younger age group, a lot of different factors, but it seems like we're doing a little bit better. But if you look at these four curves, you can see that they're different. LA County and California seem to fit into a one peak pattern, U.S. is a little bit different because we're almost an amalgam of 50 different countries. And then there's the global outbreak. So you, you have to look, don't look at the scale here, but only the shape of the curves that are very, very revealing in terms of how difficult it is to get a handle on this. And if you wanna compare this to 1918, uh, we had three very distinct peaks during that time 100 years ago. This is a, a, a a graph of, of deaths in England, which are pretty characteristics of what, what went on globally. We had 675,000 US deaths in 1918 and 1919 in a US population that was one third of what it is today, which would equilibrate to about 2 million deaths today. So we haven't reached that point yet, but we're still far along. Transmission is the key issue here. You know, there's respiratory, transmission and contact transmission. Contact is, a, is avoided by surface cleaning and hand washing, although there's a lot of controversy about how important this is and whether it's really important at all. There's also a controversy with respiratory transmission 
as to how much is droplet and how much is aerosol. And that's been debated and redebated, and we still don't know. And we counter that with masks, distancing, and avoiding large gatherings. Now, why masks, people ask? Well, there's two ways to look at why masks are helpful. One is to look at the actual exhalation of a cough or a breath when you are talking or when you're coughing, when you're sneezing, when you're in a room with someone. And that can be measured. We can measure the actually how far something goes with a mask and how far something goes without a mask. So that's the individual level. But we can also look at it on an epidemiological cohort level where we look at people who are in contact with people who are sick and we look at how much mask wearing there is. And there is clearly a correlation there. The more mask wearing, the less, less of a problem it is. So we look at it epidemiologically as well as on an individual basis. Now the surface stability is very problematic. We've looked at a lot of different ways of handling this. And we've looked at measuring by PCR how much viral particles there are on a particular surface. But there are problems with this. You know, all this was done in an indoor laboratory setting. Viability probably drops off very fast, especially outdoors with wind and sunlight. You know, they repeated the study looking only at temperature issues and found that there is definitely correlation with temperature. The virus likes the cold, it doesn't like the warm. And also we know that it's very easily killed with lots of things like soap and sanitizers and alcohol. Now, what about bubbles or pods? And they're very important to deal with. You know, they are a gamble. The more people you have in your realm, in your, in your pod, the more of a chance you have that if one gets sick, everybody has to be quarantined or isolated. And we need to pick the number carefully. Should it be eight? Should it be 10? Should it be 12? We have to pick the number in a very intelligent way. And this has worked for some athletic teams. The, the Lakers, seem to have done very well with it. The Dodgers did well with it until the seventh inning of the game yesterday where all of a sudden we realized one of the players, Justin Turner was infected and this is gonna create quite a problem in terms of contact tracing. But there are certainly among students, especially there are certainly huge psychological benefits about lying, about allowing a greater exposure to other people than just being so isolated in the room. But what about super spreader events, which are getting a lot of play lately. It started with SARS in an elevator in a Hong Kong hotel and spread to multiple countries from there. We also know that maybe about 10% of people are causing about 80% of new infections. So there's a disequilibrium here that's hard to explain. We see this in large indoor gatherings, such as bars and nightclubs, but we also do see them in outdoor settings as well. And CDC has changed its recommendations lately 15 minutes within six feet indoors now is done in a cumulative way rather than in a single exposure way. And this is based on some anecdotal experience they have, but there's been no real studies I'm aware of that substantiate this. And they looked at a database of more than 1500 super spreader events and found that nearly all of them took place indoors, but they were especially prominent in places where you had a prolonged period of people together, such as nursing homes, prisons, cruise ships, and worker housing. But these cold temperatures I mentioned before, such as in meat and dairy and frozen food plants, seem to be also at higher risk. But what about vaccine? And I'll start with where we are today. Okay, we have an oversight process for those of you that are worried about should I take the vaccine? Has it been properly studied? We have four different controls. We have an industry controlled by, by the nine major pharmaceutical companies. We have an independent oversight committee that will be responsive to each vaccine. We also have been told by Governor Newsom that he will not allow any vaccine that hasn't been thoroughly tested. And Dr. Fauci has jurisdiction over all of the vaccines that come under the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. But getting the vaccine out is a much bigger problem. We talk about conventional phase three trials, which all of these vaccines are undergoing. But that's not the only kind of trial we can do. We can do vaccine challenge trials, which people don't like because nobody wants to give live vaccine to anybody. But they're look, looking at that in England, for example. And after the fact, we have comparative vaccine trials and stepped wedge trials. 
But there's also the issue of reticence, the anti-vaxxers, those that are just misinformed. And what about the people that have too small a numbers within the cohort vaccine testing group to be able to give an answer? The elderly, the essential workers, the healthcare workers, there may not be enough power in the studies to tell those people whether the vaccine is a go or not. And there's also distribution problems, the two dose vaccines versus the one dose vaccines, the ones that require a cold chain of minus 70 degrees, which will make them impossible to distribute from pharmacies or physician offices. We need an equitable plan. We need to know what to do if a vaccine comes out, we start taking it, and then another vaccine comes out and the perception is that it's a better vaccine. And we also have a WHO COMVAX group of 150 countries that are getting together to distribute vaccine in an equitable way. We have been taken away from that initiative and that might change with the new election. But what about US, UCLA in terms of testing? Well, in October 13 to 25, ASH had about 123 positives, a 0.63% positivity. We also had a cluster of three cases in one dormitory, and this basically initiated enhanced testing capabilities, twice a week instead of once a week for the who we considered were the highest groups. And over this past current week, we've done more than 6,000 tests, and we've had an additional seven positives. Overall, there's been a total of about 328 positives as of October 22nd. Now contrast this with a, with a college like Texas Tech. They've had 17,133 positives. It's a staggering number out of their 40,000 student population. They have about 10 times as many people in the dorms as we do. Football games are on and their seating is at 25% capacity. 60% of their classes have been allowed to meet in person. They're, they have a ratio of one to 18 county residents that are currently infected. And even that 17,000 mark may be low because their testing is voluntary and there's no real push to do it in a mandatory way. They also have 408 of their students from California and what will happen to those students at Thanksgiving? Are they gonna come back to California? Or are they gonna stay in Texas? So this has been touched on before, so I won't spend much time on it, but this is what we're doing in this realm. We're doing both symptomatic and surveillance testing. We're gonna be adding wastewater testing. We have a number of IT initiatives, such as the Google Apple app, for example, that was mentioned, the wellness check survey, heat maps for mobile testing locations, and a dashboard. We're also following the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the masking, the distancing, the avoiding large groups, we're encouraging compliance. Uh, we're countering this information as best we can and we're starting to get ready for vaccine. We do surveillance testing to prevent outbreaks and clusters and when, this enables us to do this quickly. We can assess current trending prevalence in these asymptomatics which compromise maybe half of all cases. So we can get a better idea of what's going on in general now and in the future. So heading into the fall, which we're, we're just about there now, we're looking at prevalence here and around us worsening. We're looking at colder weather with more time spent indoors. We have the possibility of concurrent problems with influenza and respiratory syncytial virus. We have to contend with COVID fatigue, with laxer guidelines, mandates and directives that are going to put a lot of pressure on the state and in the county to do that. We also have to look at the young and their habits. We have to watch travelers, those that are non-compliant. We have to look at marches and demonstrations and see where they take us. And what about after the fall? We have lots of unanswered questions. You know, we get a positive test. Does that mean infection or does that mean transmissibility? We've seen a trend to non-metropolitan areas, to the younger, to less deaths. What's the next trend gonna give us? You know, we have therapeutics, which are, haven't been com coming out in large numbers that could be a game changer once we get good ones. How do super spreader events happen? What defines community spread? What's the duration of immunity? There was a large study out of England just this week that looked at immunity went down as antibody testing was done in, in communities all over the country there. 
We need better management of rampant misinformation. We continue to need more testing as well as consistent and funded guidelines. So we have herd immunity either from vaccine or hopefully not from a natural way. We may end up just having a low level endemic state of COVID that where once in a while somebody gets infected, but the vast majority of the population is okay. And eventually getting to a better new normal. And with that, I'll turn it over to Luby to continue. Thank you, Dr. Johanna. It's always important to have that information. The more knowledgeable we are, I think the more we can understand the situation currently. Um, I'll try to lighten up the conversation a little bit and focus on resources that we have available for staff and faculty. And I wanna thank the staff assembly, uh, not only for hosting this event, but also for um, staying so active during this difficult and challenging period. I think for all of us to be engaged in the campus uh, is really critical at this time. And I wanna thank all of you who are listening in for your dedication, uh, your resilience, and also for being so productive uh, during this period of time. Uh, most importantly, uh, the, the key goals we have uh, are to keep everyone safe, to support your well-being, which is critical, to keep everyone working, and to also keep everyone connected. And as we uh, work remotely and learn more about the pandemic, I think we will need to continue to rely on one another um, for safety considerations and also to stay productive in our work. All of us are learning how to work remotely and I'm especially appreciative of those individuals on our campus who are not only working remotely, but also taking care of their families at the same time. Uh, this is a real challenge and it's uh, teaching us a lot and the work-life balance that we thought we understood is something brand new. And because we're going to be working in this environment for quite some time, I wanted to also focus on the fact that there's some positive elements here. Uh, we're gonna be changing the way work is conducted and how we relate to one another. And the more we can have processes available uh, for collaboration and for supporting one another, I think the more effective and the more um, safe and uh, well we will all feel. Uh, I wanted to mention some of the resources that are available to everyone. First, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to campus human resources or to health human resources on issues where you may uh, need some advice or support. We have uh, special programs available both for individual counseling and group uh, activities through our staff and faculty counseling center. Um, as I think you all know, uh, the CAPS uh, support is also available for students. And we've recently uh, converted all of our training and development programs to online platforms. And I'm pleased to say that we have some new programs available such as the Timeless Skills series. And we just recently uh, purchased LinkedIn Learning which is going to have a large number, about 16,000 new courses available for the campus. And that will be coming very soon. So with that quick introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Jessica for the question and answer period. Thank you so much, Luby. Uh, we'll go into some questions. We've been receiving a lot of great questions through the Q&A feature. So please continue to send those. And again, if we don't get to your question, um, we're going to be working on an FAQ doc that will hopefully answer any outstanding questions. And thankfully, all of our panelists have agreed to stay on a bit later to try to cover some of these. So if you're able, stay with us. And if not, you're welcome to review the recording once that's up and available if you need to leave right at one o'clock. 
So our first question is, what is the task force's communication strategy for disseminating information broadly to the UCLA community? Michael Morans, would you like to answer that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we have a variety of things that we're, we're trying to do. Um, we're working very closely with um, Vice Chancellor Mary Saka, who is on the task force to develop a, a range of ways to communicate with people, uh, not only through the traditional Bruin Post, but through social media, more targeted communications. Um, and uh, also we do have a, um, not only a, a web page uh, for COVID-19 resources, but we uh, also have an email, COVID-19 at ucla.edu, and we welcome uh, any questions or suggestions that you might have about issues to take up. Uh, the working groups themselves are uh, so sources for information to get out, and we are trying to move issues through the task force and then bring announcements out to campus as effectively as we can. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Luby. What is the plan for curtailment, furloughs, and or early retirement options for staff? Thank you, Jessica. Well, we have quite a few uh, different proposals that are currently under review. Uh, the most uh, simple one is the winter closure plan that we issued to the campus a few weeks ago. Uh, and as you know, uh, we're proposing that six days be part of the break this year. We thought everyone needed a longer break to support well-being and to have time to do other things. Uh, we are using the usual approach where vacation leave can be utilized uh, as well as allowing use of vacation in advance of accrual. And that start date would be December 21st. So I hope all of you have had a chance to review it. We're looking at comments. And although a final decision hasn't been made, this is something that we think will be very helpful to the campus overall. We also are looking at a proposal that was recently released by the Office of the President. It's called an extended curtailment plan. And this is an approach uh, that's being proposed for all of the University of California campuses. Uh, the plan can be used anytime during this fiscal year, 2020 to 2021. And it <clears throat> uh, is proposed that there be five days off at a minimum, and those days would be paid and unpaid. Uh, the idea being used by the Office of the President is that it should be a tiered approach. Their intent is to shield the lower paid employees from the impact of having the full five days unpaid. So they've created a number of different tiers that we're currently reviewing. And for the higher paid employees, only some vacation days would be eligible for use. Uh, this puts obviously a greater burden on higher paid employees and we'll want to make sure that if this kind of a plan moves forward, that it's done in the most fair and equitable way uh, possible. So I want to emphasize no decisions have been made on that plan. If you're interested in reviewing it, <clears throat> we just received a word last night, as a matter of fact, that it's posted on UCNet, that's the Office of the President website. Also for our campus, we've been doing a special survey to get feedback on the system-wide plan. And so far, after only one week, we have more than 1,700 responses. So we're gonna be analyzing all of those responses. And again, no final decisions have been made, but we're very interested in getting the opinions of faculty staff um, throughout the campus. And we will be in touch with you as more information becomes available. Some of you also mentioned or asked whether there would be an, an early retirement plan. 
Um, it's probably unlikely that that type of plan is available because of the need to keep the retirement system financially healthy. So as we receive more information, we'll be happy to share it with you. And I wanna encourage you, if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to, camp to contact Campus Human Resources. Thank you. Thank you, Luby. We'll go with a question for Dr. Katona. How is the university managing contact tracing and safety precautions for visitors or non-affiliates on campus? Well, first of all, let me say that efficient contact tracing is essential to outbreak containment, whether they're a visitor or whether they're somebody who is here all the time. So it's important to contact trace and it's important to get it done quickly and efficiently. If you have a few cases on campus, the designated contact tracers that we've hired can take care of that. When the county has a thousand new cases a day, that's much, much more difficult to contact trace. Um, the, the Dodgers are gonna have a hard time contact tracing from what happened yesterday. But it, but it doesn't really matter who they are, as long as they've been on campus and they fall into the system, they're gonna have to be contact traced and it has to be done efficiently. We've set up our own contact tracing group within UCLA. So all of the campus community, including uh, visitors and volunteers that come to campus and have been exposed or tested positive uh, would go through our infection management team and, or excuse me, exposure management team uh, to do the contact tracing as quickly as possible because that's uh, so important in an effort to help reduce the spread. Thank you both for those answers. Our next question is, what phase of opening campus will allow a hybrid model of telecommuting and working on campus? Vice Chancellor Beck or Luby, would you like to answer this question? I'll actually answer that and, and uh, one of the other questions on the list here because they're combined, which is, what is the tentative timeline for moving campus to phase two of reopening? And, and they're re related. And that's dependent, as I said earlier, on the state or the county moving into tier two. And that will allow, a, and then the county then allowing us as a higher educational institution to have more individuals on campus, particularly in an instruction purpose. With, re, with regard to specific work, as uh, a Bruin Post went out earlier the, in the fall, is that if you can effectively work uh, telecommute or work remotely, uh, you should be doing that at least through the end of winter quarter. And we'll be reevaluating to determine whether that will continue even longer. I think that again, because of the fact that, that UCLA is so dense in its environment, it's such a compact campus, that we'll be encouraging individuals to, to work remotely as long as they possibly can. And I think even after the a virus is for the most part under control to the extent uh, that we move forward, that we will then see a more comprehensive uh, view of, of hybrid telecommuting uh, potentially on a more permanent basis for those that it's working for. And those are things that we're uh, looking at now. Uh, Luby uh, referred to that a little, a little bit. But until we get to a position in which the virus is really uh, uh, no longer a significant risk, uh, working remotely will, will continue for the most part. Thank you. Did you wanna add anything, Luby? Uh, yes, um, it, it's interesting that I'm hearing from all employers, including companies like Google and some of the high tech firms, but also from the public sector, that telecommuting is going to be here to stay I don't think any of us realized how quickly we would move into it. And that's one of the positive aspects of the current environment that we're learning how to work remotely. And I think it's going to become at least a part of the work in the future. And we need to redefine uh, what that means in many ways, including the emotional and psychological well being of employees. So I look forward to more work in that area. Thank you, Luby. Um, and another follow-up question, uh, somewhat related, um, is 
what are some uh, mental health and wellness resources that are available for staff? And what's the stance on taking mental health days off during this time? Okay, thank you, Jessica. Uh, I think this is a critical need. Uh, we're finding that not only those who are working remotely, but those who are here working generally in this kind of environment where there's great anxiety and stress based on the unknowns. That's why I appreciated Dr. Uh, Katana's comments so much because the more knowledgeable we are, I think the more we feel that we can be in control of our situation. But there is a lot of um, opportunity to seek resources where, when they are needed. I think it's critical for the well being of our employees. So I wanted to mention our staff and faculty counseling center, as I indicated, is available not only for individual counseling, but also for virtual sessions with, with groups. And they're, they're developing special toolkits for managers so that managers can be effective in this new environment. We also have a brand new subgroup that is part of this larger task force called Wellness and Work Expectations. It's being led by Wendy Slusser, who, whom some of you know, uh, who has been instrumental as a leader for the Healthy Campus Initiative. And her work and the work of that subcommittee, I think are gonna lead to some wonderful recommendations and ideas for how we can continue to be successful in this remote environment. And again, I also, just one more quick point, uh, the special needs of employees who are working from home and who have children has already been taken into account by allowing them to use sick leave uh, for circumstances where they're caring for children but are not necessarily ill. So I think the the idea of taking a uh, special time to deal with health and wellness. Ruby, is I think, I think your mic is a little bit uh, low on the audio. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, Sorry I about that, I, go ahead, Luby. That's okay, I think I'm finished. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so our next question will go to Dr. Katona. Uh, how will the development and availability of a COVID vaccine impact returning to campus and what will the requirements be for getting vaccinated? Those are questions that are currently unanswerable. We have a dozen vaccines that are in the works. We have no federal guidance on exactly how the distribution will be done. We don't know whether they're gonna be 50% effective or 75% effective or whatever. So that's really an unanswerable question at this point. I think we have to see how it evolves over the next few months with not only the phase three studies, but also the post-marketing studies to see whether small groups like those over the age of 65 are actually gonna benefit the way the larger group benefits. So hopefully over the coming months, we'll have better abilities to answer that question. Great, thank you. Our next question, is the university exploring other technology options such as new software platforms to support online learning and virtual events? Vice Chancellor Beck. That's a great question. Just as a catch, we're all now uh, getting very familiar with Zoom and comfortable with that. And just as a, a slight, in February, we were using Zoom about 4,500 sessions a week. And a few weeks ago, I'd asked for the current update and it's uh, about 75,000 sessions a week. So you can see how much, uh, if you feel like you're over Zoomed, uh, that's probably true uh, because uh, we're all turning to Zoom. We've been looking at other platforms and IT services uh, a few weeks ago actually launched uh, an enterprise version of Slack as a way to uh, create more opportunities uh, to create uh, discussion groups and, uh, and be able to create linkages with the community that's working more remotely. And so we'll continue to look at ways in which we can enhance the, envi the remote environment with uh, applications and uh, Slack and Zoom are just some examples. We also went with an enterprise license for Adobe, uh, I'm forgetting what the, the full name of that uh, suite is and it's the usage has uh, gone up dramatically as a result of that. So those are opportunities that end up reducing the cost for students that they were previously uh, paying for some of these applications and also makes it readily available 
uh, for all uh, members of the campus community. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Michael Morans. Is the university considering expanding online courses even after return to campus? Uh, that's a great question. I, I would say that um, I think we can expect that there will be some expansion of um, online and remote uh, teaching, but that uh, we need to be uh, assured that uh, it maintains UCLA quality and also that we remain aware of the importance to both students and faculty of the in-person experience. So I don't think anyone needs to worry that uh, the online or remote will displace uh, the residential face-to-face uh, -face, uh, teaching, but it's, uh, it's very likely that there will be some expansion of remote and online uh, learning as we go forward. There are two working groups that touch on this, the education working group and the teaching and learning working group. Uh, the education working group is led by Adriana Galvan, who's the Dean of Undergraduate Education and the teaching and learning group is led by Jen Reif, who has been spearheading a lot of the online uh, course development and uh, working through the digital teaching environment for the campus for several years. Thank you. Our next question is for Vice Chancellor Beck. Will there be added personnel to disinfect classrooms between student groups and usage? Yes, the facilities management uh, since the pandemic started has been increasing the level of care within all of the facilities across the campus, particularly where there's uh, higher populations of in individuals that are uh, having to work on, on campus or in classrooms or laboratories where individuals are learning. So there's personnel that have been reassigned from other tasks that are involved in that work, uh, cleaning common services, and also increase the frequency of disinfect, disinfection within the classrooms. And in each of the classrooms, there's also hand sanitizer wipes so that students and faculty can uh, clean their, the surface that they're going to uh, be at uh, prior to their uh, their course, their lab, or their in minimal instruction, and that'll that'll continue. Great, and we have a follow up question also related to facilities. Will the campus be updating the HVAC systems, including installing HEPA filters? So, in all of our newer buildings, they actually exceed the the recommendations for air quality. This is something that we've actually studied as a result of the fires the last couple of years. Some of our older buildings uh, do not, uh, the ventilation systems uh, don't have the capacity for uh, the higher uh, filtration conditions. And so uh, there's additional recommendations associated with those facilities and facilities management is continuing uh, to evaluate the options uh, at the moment with lower occupancies in the buildings. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, helps, even in some of the older buildings, helps reduce the risk. And uh, I know uh, Dr. Katona has been working with our staff on this, so I'm not sure if he wanted to add something to that answer. Yeah, we, we look particularly at the pre-K through 12 area uh, to look at the classrooms there and, and seeing what uh, the HVAC systems will deliver, what the filtration rate is, what the air exchanges per hour are. And uh, the problem is there's no def definite standards in terms of what would be acceptable, but we've come to a conclusion, putting all these parameters together to come up with some recommendations about what constitutes what we'd, we'd be acceptable with. Thank you. Uh, another question for Dr. Katona. Will saliva tests be available in lieu of nasal tests? Well, I'm not sure that the issue is in lieu of nasal tests. You know, we're, we're evolving with testing from the very uncomfortable nasopharyngeal to the mid turbinate, which are a little bit less uncomfortable, to saliva and maybe even breath tests at some point. The problem is the number of particles are less, so the tests are a little bit more difficult to, to have power. Um, but we are moving in the direction of, of having more saliva tests that can be done at your dorm 
put into a box, mailed or dropped off at a drop box. And uh, that's that's where we're heading right now. And the, the, lab, the campus lab that I mentioned earlier about setting up a high throughput testing is actually a saliva based test. And we're very excited about the potential for that. Great, thank you. Uh, so it is one o'clock now. So thank you for those um, joining us who have to hop off. Uh, we will take a couple more questions, um, but if you have to hop off now, uh, feel free to check back for the recording um, to review additional questions that you might've missed. Um, so let's go with the next question. Uh, so some staff just come to campus occasionally. What's the level of frequency of coming to campus, would you require um, staff to do the mandatory COVID testing? So we're still uh, uh, sort of refining that, but at the moment, if you're coming, if your cohort is required to be tested, let's say once a week, and you are coming to campus once every three weeks, then you wouldn't need to be tested. If you are coming to campus, uh, once a week, then we we would uh, we'd want you to be tested uh, during that uh, during that time in which you are uh, on campus. And there was another question that I saw earlier about are we going to create additional testing centers? And so I'll take that really quickly. And uh, we do have uh, two centers, one on the hill for uh, students and staff that work in that environment, and then we have Collins Court on the main campus. We're also uh, looking to set up in the next uh, week or so a facility, a testing facility in CHS uh, so that we can uh, uh, make the testing capability, the testing centers closer to where a lot of the research activity is occurring. And then we also have a mobile lab, which is a, a converted or do too much conversion, but it's the utilization of a Bruin bus and that'll be used for uh, testing in the in neighborhoods and, re and remote living environments. Uh, near the campus and then also uh, will be utilized for testing after the main uh, testing facilities on the on the campus uh, are are closed and there was another quick question with regard to testing as well and that is are we testing individuals who are living off campus and i'm assuming the question relates to not in, living in university owned housing and we are strongly encouraging uh, students that are living in particularly around the campus in the North Village or fraternities or sororities or other uh, uh, congregal living facilities to actually be tested on a weekly basis and uh, they'll be able to uh, sign up uh, for testing and the, the thought is that if they're not already coming to campus then they would utilize the mobile testing facility as they're available and you'll be able as you go online uh, to do that, you'll be able to pull down the schedule specifically for the mobile lab if that's what your interests are. Thank you. And briefly, I just want to address there have been a couple questions um, in the Q&A about the recording of the session. So we'll make sure that it's posted on our Staff Assembly YouTube page and share it out via our newsletter. So if you're not receiving our newsletter, you can email us at staffassembly at ucla.edu to go ahead and get added to that listserv and we'll definitely send out an email to folks letting them know when the recording is available to view as well as the FAQ doc. Um, so our next question, um, can you give us a brief financial impact uh, due to COVID? I can uh, try and do that uh, very quickly. So there are a number of uh, impacts that are being felt by the lack of operations on the campus. Certainly, uh, Jessica is familiar with the impacts to ASUCLA uh, by not having, by not having uh, so many students on campus uh, going through the stores and, and restaurants. UCLA housing is uh, probably going to be the most impacted uh, department on the campus uh, because of the significant reduction in students uh, living in campus facilities. Certainly the health system uh, as a result of their uh, ramping down of elective uh, surgeries and other procedures uh, in effort to prepare uh, uh, additional space within the hospitals for a wave of COVID patients, which fortunately did not uh, materialize. Uh, 
but uh, was a substantial economic uh, hit for the health system. And there are other limited impacts across the campus. Uh, the impacts are probably uh, hundreds of million. Well, I know that they're hundreds of millions of dollars. I think we're still assembling uh, what that the total impact would be to the campus. I know uh, Vice Chancellor Goldman, this is a uh, top of mind for him and uh, continuing to assemble that. Thank you. And a quick question, uh, maybe from Michael Morans. Uh, do you know when international students will be able to return to campus? We don't. Um, the, as some of you may know, um, the federal government has um, uh, had allowed certain exceptions to their restrictions on international students and in-person classes in the spring. They did not extend and um, our ability to offer in-person classes depends again, as Michael and I have said, on um, the county uh, being able to move to tier two and allowing us to expand those. Uh, at this point, we don't know for sure whether the uh, federal government will continue its current policy, which does not allow um, new international students to come uh, if they do not have in-person classes and retain their visa status. So until the public health situation changes, we're um, as much uncertain as uh, everyone else is and uh, we're doing our best to communicate with them. But um, we uh, with international students, but at this point, we don't have control over the situation. Thank you so much. And we'll take one last question. Uh, so is the flu vaccine mandatory for staff? I can start that. It's not mandatory. We, we have a hard time making it mandatory, but we can certainly strongly encourage it. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, anti-vaxxer movement against vaccines, which is going to be problematic for, for COVID vaccine. Flu vaccine, remember, at best is maybe 50 to 70% effective, um, which means that it is effective, even though it's not 100% effective. But I'm not sure that we can mandate it, but we can very strongly encourage it uh, to faculty and staff and students. And Thank then, you. Oh, Luby, since that's a moving, uh, constantly moving item, did you want to add anything to uh, Dr. Katona's comments? Well, we're providing a release time to encourage all faculty and staff to get the flu vaccine. Uh, for those who need to come to campus, uh, that is something that's being required. Um, and if there are any questions about that, we have information on our website. Thank you, Luby. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. We really appreciate the opportunity to connect with everyone today and thanks our panelists so much for joining us as well as our tech team behind the scenes for making this possible and helping us facilitate this webinar. The recording of this session will be available shortly. Like I mentioned before, we'll share it in our newsletter and include it on our staff assembly website. You can email us at staffassembly at ucla.edu or follow us on social media at UCLASA for updates relevant to staff. We will also be working on a list of FAQs that will hopefully answer some of the questions we weren't able to get to today. And I also wanted to briefly mention that we are in the process of planning a second town hall sometime in December for any additional updates that may come between now and then. So look out for the date for that to register and submit questions as well. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone.